Hello, everybody, and welcome again to another OpenShift Commons briefing. This time, we're going to have an introduction to container-native virtualization with Stephen Gordon from Red Hat. Um, the nature of this uh, briefing is that it's going to be a presentation up front. You can ask questions in the chat. There'll be live Q&A at the end, and the video will be posted along with the slides on um, YouTube and on OpenShift.com slash blog um, right afterwards. So without further ado, um, Stephen, introduce yourself, and let's, let's get it going. All righty. Uh, so my name is Stephen Gordon. I am a product manager uh, at Red Hat focused on a technology we're calling Container Native Virtualization, uh, which is based on an upstream project called Cupa. Um, I've been working in the virtualization space at Red Hat for about eight years. Um, previously, I was the product manager for OpenStack Compute at Red Hat, uh, and also I spent a decent num number of years writing documentation for Red Hat virtualization as well. Um, so as Diane alluded to, uh, in this presentation, I'm going to aim to give you an overview of what container-native virtualization is, um, and also a short demo uh, where I poke it on a running OpenShift system, uh, just to give you a bit of an idea of how we're, we're fitting virtual machines uh, into a Kubernetes constructs here. Um, so the disclaimer that applies, uh, so we are actively uh, building uh, this technology. Uh, there will be a preview in an upcoming OpenShift release. Um, people are also certainly welcome to try out upstream components um, on OpenShift today or on any Kubernetes cluster for that matter. Uh, and I'll provide some instructions on how you'd go about doing that towards the end. Um, but basically just be warned that this is still emerging at this point, uh, although we are very excited about it and certainly welcome uh, discussion and feedback uh, as we continue to build out the offering. Uh, so in terms of level setting, uh, I usually like to talk about uh, the story so far uh, for virtual machines uh, in a containerized world. Um, so when we think about the intersection of virtualization and containers uh, thus far, you know, the primary place uh, where those two technologies have come together is when folks need a place to install, run, and manage their Kubernetes clusters. Um, so if we think, think about our typical organization, you know, we've built up a lot of experience over the last 10 to 15 years um, plus in managing virtual machines. So if I'm a developer or someone who just wants to try out uh, technologies like uh, Kubernetes and Docker and OpenShift for the first time, um, the easiest way for me to get compute resources more often than not is for me to go and grab uh, virtual machines from either uh, an OpenStack or a VMware or even a public cloud environment. Uh, where all of those things are typically going to serve you up virtual machines, uh, and that provides a good place to get started running your first uh, container clusters. Um, the other use case uh, we've seen a lot of discussion about for containers and virtualization is around, I already have an application container, uh, but I'm concerned about providing uh, strict isolation um, for those containers using uh, hardware virtualization technology. And that is what uh, the Carter containers um, and GVisor projects are largely concerned with. Um, so they're saying, if you have an application container and you want strict isolation for that, we can help. Um, that is not the problem space uh, we are aiming at with container-native virtualization um, and Qvert. What we're thinking about is, what about existing workloads? Uh, so as we see this trend in the industry um, towards uh, container platforms, uh, like OpenShift, where Kubernetes is becoming the standard way of orchestrating and managing um, new applications we're creating, uh, the question arises, what to do with the many virtualized workloads that are out there and already exist um, and aren't really going anywhere fast uh, for business and technical reasons? Uh, so from a business perspective, um, it doesn't necessarily make sense to containerize every workload that's out there overnight. Um, but also from a technical perspective, uh, often my applications have, uh, my existing applications have strict dependencies on uh, different operating systems uh, or even older versions of uh, the kernel, uh, if we're talking about Linux operating systems, or potentially different K-mods uh, that I need installed uh, for my application to work. Um, all of those things are things that I may want for my application, but don't necessarily want for my host system uh, in a containerized environment where I'm sharing a kernel. Um, and when we're thinking about this, there are existing solutions that uh, start attempting to converge uh, containers and virtualization. 
um, but typically they force us to still manage them relatively separately. So the thinking behind container native virtualization in Kubebird is about how can we bring these two worlds closer together to offer more of a consistent experience regardless of whether I'm interacting and manage, interacting with and managing the application uh, that is in a container or in a virtual machine. So container native virtualization enables to, uh, sorry, intends to deliver this by enabling OpenShift to run virtual machines side by side with application containers in a common shared environment. Uh, so we want to make it as easy and as seamless to add a virtual machine to your OpenShift project uh, as it is to add an application container. Uh, so that means making them available directly from the service catalog uh, and also, of course, uh, via the CLI constructs, uh, which I'll demonstrate later. Um, it does leverage currently the existing uh, investments we've made in uh, KVM in particular. Uh, so we gain all of the uh, knowledge we've built up in, in the KVM, QMU, and Libvirt projects over the years in building the Linux hypervisor stack. Uh, what we're effectively doing is leveraging the fact that we have KVM um, plugged into the host kernel, uh, but we're taking the user space, which effectively represents the virtual machine, and putting that in an application container, just like we could containerize any other Linux process um, that we happen to have. Uh, as I mentioned, we are planning to offer technology preview access in an upcoming release of OpenShift. Um, but you can also certainly uh, try it out with the upstream bits um, using, uh, for example, OpenShift Origin, uh, which is actually what I'll be using for the demo shortly. Um, when we bring virtual machines into this environment, we of course benefit from the fact that we can share placement and scheduling logic, uh, network security, uh, isolation, quotas, and so on um, with, uh, with Kubernetes. And the benefit of this when we start thinking about the types of applications we can build is we are imagining that in the future we'll see more and more complex applications that are comprised both of newly written application containers uh, and existing uh, business functions contained in virtual machines that make up this one, uh, one unit of work effectively or one complex application that we're orchestrating. So the ability to treat those in the same way and use the shared constructs of Kubernetes to manage them it's a very powerful thing. So what is Qvert, uh, the upstream Qvert project, uh, which you can find at qvert.io, as listed on the slide here. Um, so Qvert is a custom resource definition. Uh, so for, for folks who aren't familiar with it, uh, custom resource definitions are a way of extending uh, the Kubernetes API uh, to add new objects at the top level um, in a nicely uh, pluggable way. Um, it, when it was originally being defined, uh, it was referred to, if I remember correctly, as uh, third-party resources, but custom resource definition is the final uh, term that's used in the API as we define these. Uh, so the idea is if I imp implement a custom resource definition uh, for my object, I can effectively drop it onto an existing Kubernetes cluster um, just by running uh, a manifest against it. Um, and then I can extend the API to represent a new object. So in this particular case uh, with Qvert, uh, we're adding a number of objects actually. So we have a concept of the virtual machine itself, uh, which is the virtual machine definition. And then we have a concept of a virtual machine instance, which is an actual running virtual machine. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the context of the demo uh, so that hopefully it'll make more sense. Um, the intent in doing this is to take as Kubernetes native an approach as possible to bringing virtualization into, uh, into OpenShift so that it doesn't feel like it's a second class citizen, but rather that a virtual machine is a first class object um, that you can interact with um, in the same way as anything else in the system. Um, and this also means we can leverage constructs like the container networking interface, uh, container storage interface, and other Kubernetes native integrations. Um, so that we can share, for example, uh, the pod networking constructs and have a VM and a, an application container plugged into the same network uh, if we so desire. Uh, and as illustrated on the right there, of course, we also have the ability to uh, schedule and run uh, both VMs and application containers side by side um, because ultimately these are still represented as pods uh, from a Kubernetes scheduling point of view. So the Qvert top-level organization on um, GitHub um, includes the bulk of the components of container native virtualization. Uh, there are others, though, that are worth mentioning. Um, so in particular, uh, we have the 
containerized data importer uh, or data importer, uh, depending on your persuasion, uh, which is a uh, somewhat independent project aimed at providing a way to easily import images in various formats to a Kubernetes persistent volume. Um, so in particular for virtualization, we're primarily concerned about being able to ingest uh, the many QCAP2 and RAW and so on images that exist out there on the internet uh, for things like Fedora. Um, but also for other purposes, you, also, you have a variety of other file formats that it can ingest and write to a PV as well, um, if that's something you find a use for uh, for your application containers as well. Uh, we also have a number of extensions to the OpenShift web console we're working on, uh, both in terms of um, being able to generically represent CRDs in the UI, uh, but also specific to virtual machines, there are some things we would like to represent in the UI uh, so you can imagine uh, a virtual machine has some actions that don't necessarily apply to a pod, uh, like various things around the power state, for example, um, that we still want to provide a mechanism for how someone could get to that using the UI without having to jump out to the CLI. And finally, we also have done uh, some work around uh, making Vert V2V available as an, an Ansible playbook bundle. Uh, so what Vert V2V does is it enables us to bring in a virtual machine um, from an existing uh, virtualization platform like uh, VMware vCenter um, and run that on a KVM hypervisor, in this case uh, using container native virtualization. Uh, so in terms of the anatomy of QVert itself at a very high level, uh, poke a few of these pods when I get to the demo. Um, so we define, uh, over on the left we have our user who is interacting at the API level with the custom resource uh, to make a request. So it might be the virtual machine custom resource, for example, in, in this case. Um, we then in turn have a vert controller, uh, which is the controller for the CID and does a lot of the work from a control plane perspective, which is handing off to a vert handler um, and the VM itself. And the VM itself, as I mentioned earlier, is really the same QMU process that we would have run traditionally on Red Hat Virtualization or Red Hat OpenStack Platform. Uh, but that QME process is now uh, itself in an application container, which is in a pod uh, running on the uh, OpenShift minion. So in terms of um, the reason we have the CRD, so uh, as I alluded to in the conversation about the UI, virtual machines have their own uh, various uh, common parameters and actions that need to be, we need to be able to perform on them. Um, and traditionally, we have used the libvert as a way to expose those knobs to various systems. Uh, and you can see some examples on the right in terms of the virtual machine object. Uh, so here we have um, a virtual machine domain. It has a number of devices attached to it, has some uh, resource requests, and then it has some, some networking requests as well. So we're creating this top-level API object uh, to represent a virtual machine specifically. Uh, which ultimately gets translated by the QVert components into something that can actually uh, be scheduled and run as a pod. Um, by implementing this as a CRD, uh, we do benefit from inheriting a lot of things from uh, Kubernetes itself uh, around authorization, but also storage and networking, as I mentioned before. Ultimately, the aim is that we can run application containers and virtual machines side by side uh, on the same OpenShift nodes uh, and sharing resources, um, and that is what we're enabling uh, using container native virtualization. Uh, we do, however, also um, have some integrations that allow us to use something called uh, libcinder to access uh, existing storage solutions um, from the OpenStack ecosystem as well. Uh, so this is not about running OpenStack so much as allowing us to plug uh, the OpenStack block device drivers directly into OpenShift and Kubernetes uh, using the container storage interface, which is something we're actively working on. Um, and the reason that's important is that if we think about uh, virtual machines, uh, one of the things they typically benefit from, uh, from a storage perspective that don't necessarily apply as much to application containers, is they heavily uh, use cloning uh, or storage assisted cloning where it's available uh, to do things like um, making a cloning from a template or taking snapshots. Um, and the in-tree volume drivers for Kubernetes don't support this, uh, but it is intended that cloning can be exposed through the CSI spec when it becomes available. 
Um, but the OpenStack ecosystem gives us a ready-made uh, selection of drivers that we could plug directly into CSI um, that already have cloning support for the most part. Uh, we do also have Hubert, though, the ability to fall back on host-assisted cloning uh, where necessary or where it's unavailable. So in terms of just walking through a quick example use case uh, before I jump to the demo. Um, so of course, in our example, we need to start with a VM. So I have an existing VM in my organization that performs some business function that I care about. Uh, it's exposing a service or API. Uh, I can import that virtual machine from where it already exists, uh, either using V2V uh, or from an image I might happen to have. Uh, so for example, I might have a QCAL2 image uh, exported from my existing system. Um, I can then, uh, should I desire, once I've imported it to container native virtualization, start building application containers around that service um, that that virtual machine is exposing. Um, and this is uh, easily done using the same uh, pipelines that we would normally use in OpenShift. So uh, we're able to start building on the same platform our new and uh, richer business functions around that existing one. Um, but also, if the return on investment starts making sense for me to actually decompose that application, uh, now that I've got everything running on the OpenShift platform, uh, I can also easily start pairing out pieces of that virtual machine uh, in place effectively uh, and taking those out into application containers. So I'll switch screens now, and with a bit of luck, I still have a running um, Minishift instance. Let's just check on that. All right, so we do indeed. Um, so I'm just using uh, the Minishift uh, 310 RC of OpenShift, so it's the origin one. Um, and as you can see, I also have the uh, relevant clients installed as well. Um, so the first thing I think I can do is just check. So I'm doing here, so kubectl uh, get custom resource definitions. Uh, so you can see here that the OpenShift web console has defined one for itself. Um, but you can also see that my kubert installation has added a number of custom resource definitions as well. Uh, so the first of those, uh, virtual machine instance presets. Um, this object type refers to uh, what we call presets. Um, these are very similar. Uh, to what you would uh, think of as flavors or instance types if you're familiar with Amazon uh, or OpenStack or other existing virtualization solutions. Uh, and I'll actually have some, some presets uh, in my virtual machine definitions in a second. Uh, we also have uh, virtual machine instance replica sets, uh, which as the name implies, allow me to have uh, virtual machines in my replica sets. Um, and then I have this concept of the virtual machines, which is the static definition. Uh, and also the virtual machine instances. And the reason those are two separate objects, um, if you think about pods, uh, typically for the, the pod lifecycle, uh, once I terminate it, it's gone forever. If I wanted to, want to get it back, I create a completely new pod uh, with a different identity. Uh, for virtual machines, we tend to care a little more about the state and identity of the virtual machine, uh, for better or worse. Um, so if we want to facilitate uh, bringing in an existing traditional virtual machine, we need to have some representation of the virtual machine in its powered off state. And that's where the virtual machine object comes in. Uh, when I then instantiate that virtual machine definition, I get what's called a virtual machine instance, which is the actual running virtual machine. Um, and we'll see how that works uh, in a moment. Um, by virtue of having um, the custom resources on the system, I can do things like uh, get VMIs, uh, and I see get uh, VMs as well. Now, of course, these haven't found anything yet uh, because I haven't created it. Uh, so if I have a look around here, uh, I've pre-created a definition for a simple Cirrus VM. Let's have a look at that. Um, so not surprisingly, I give my VM a name. Uh, you'll see here, so kind virtual machine is, of course, the virtual machine object I referred to, and we're specifically using the Qbert API version uh, information. Uh, and also further down here, I have a number of labels. Uh, the guest one doesn't matter too much. Um, Qbert.o slash size is an interesting one. 
so this label is effectively telling Gubert to try and match this to a preset uh, if one exists. And what you'll see in this particular YAML file is I actually define a preset at the end as well. So I have the little delimiter here to say that I'm defining a different object. Um, again, using the Qvert API construct, versioning constructs, and I'm creating a virtual machine instance preset. In this case, I'm calling it small. Uh, I'm putting it in the qvert.o slash size um, labeling space with the match labels. Um, and you'll see here the only thing this preset, this particular preset is defining is the memory size for the VM. Uh, you could also define things like CPU or even specific timer flags and things like that. Uh, so we have a different preset, for example, if we wanted to run a Windows guest, um, because Windows guest typically expects some specific things. The great thing about presets is that uh, we have the ability uh, to provide some out of the box uh, for things like Windows, so that you don't have to worry about those specific knobs at all. Um, but also that an operator or a user can define presets that they want to use for all their VMs uh, so they can um, basically avoid having to specify all the information in every single VM request. Uh, so going back to my VM definition, uh, I've defined two disks on this particular one. Uh, so in this case, because it's a Cirrus image and relatively small, I'm just using a registry disk uh, where I'm pulling an image straight from a, a Docker registry. Um, I can also, as I mentioned, use the common data importer uh, to import a disk image to PV. Uh, and that's another option as well. And I'm also defining a cloud init disk. Um, so the cloud init disk uh, maps to a volume which I actually define inline. Um, so for those familiar with cloud init, it's a way of bootstrapping a virtual machine uh, with some data that can be used during setup. And then the cloud init scripts that runs within the virtual machine can use that information to do some initial networking or user setup, should I so desire it. Um, so we, here we define in the volumes, the, basically these map to the disks above. So I have my registry volume, which is pulling uh, the Cirrus registry disk demo uh, out of the Qvert namespace. And then my cloud init volume is effectively defined in line. So this is just some base 64 encoded user data. Um, I can, in the current versions, actually not even base64 encoded. I can just include it inline if I so choose. So let's go and actually execute that um, YAML. And you'll notice I'm jumping back and forth uh, between kubectl and OC here. Uh, basically, I'm doing that just to show that you can. Um, there's really no difference which one you use. Uh, both OC and kubectl are uh, 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 equivalent in terms of their ability to understand uh, CRDs and work with them just as well as any other native uh, Kubernetes object. So I'm going to create my example. Um, so it creates both um, the VM itself uh, and it creates a virtual machine instance preset as well. Now I could, if I wanted to create more VMs based on that preset, I could do that. I don't need to redefine it every time, obviously. Uh, so if I do my OC get VMs, I now have a Cirrus VM. Now, because I have, because I didn't include uh, a running state in the VM definition, I will not yet have a VMI. Uh, so I have the ability though. So if I um, do OC edit VMI, so VM, sorry, Cirrus VM, uh, and then I can go down to the spec and go running false, do running true. And I click that, it will uh, quickly start so effectively acting as a controller. If I go as you get VMIs now, I should have Cirrus VM coming up. Uh, if I go, go and describe it, you should be able to see whether it's scheduled or not. Uh, we can see that I've missed scheduling, it's already in the running state. Um, so now I can do some things with my VM. So we also have a helper script or vertcuttle at the moment. Um, it does also act as a kubectl plugin, um, but it's actually easier to use vertcuttle directly for me. So first of all, I'm gonna show console access um, to us VM. Uh, so I've already got access to my VM um, and I can log in as the Cirrus user, go cubs go. Um, and my host system here uh, was the mini shift ISO, but you can see, see you with the, uh, Cirrus information, uh, sorry, when I say the mini shift ISO, I mean the CentOS one in this particular case. 
And so here you can see I'm running a different operating system, guest. I can then exit the console uh, using the break command. Um, and we're back to our shell. Um, the other thing I can do, so I also via VertCut, I'll have the ability to get a uh, VNC connection, uh, which is more useful for obviously uh, graphical guests, um, but basically the same thing in this particular case. Um, that I have a graphical display. Um, so the other things uh, do. So the other thing I should mention. So Vert Cuddle uh, also includes uh, start and stop actions. So um, before, just to demonstrate the way the controller works, I went in and directly edited the YAML to set the running status um, to true. Uh, I can also just do a Vert Cuddle start stop action. Uh, and we'll see, sorry, if I remember to provide the VM name. Do a uh, stop on Cirrus VM. Uh, my OC get VMIs should almost instantly, maybe not, let me take a second moment. Let's have a look at the definition here. There we go. So it has actually deleted it. It just took a second there. Okay. Um, so of course my original VM definition is still there. Uh, it's just that now when I go to edit it, uh, it will show that the uh, VM is now uh, running false um, definition. I'm sure enough. Um, show where I'm looking. Uh, running false, what I expected. Uh, the other things, so uh, obviously I stopped it here, so let's start it again so I can show what's happening. Uh, I'll also quickly, if I do a kubectl get pods in the kube system namespace, uh, we'll actually see um, the API um, for the CRD is running as two pods. Uh, they behave in an active passive fashion. Uh, same thing with the controller. Uh, and then finally, we have this handler pod, uh, which is what is actually handing off the VM launch. And then in my kubectl get pods for my local namespace, I will see the actual launcher, uh, which is where QMU and the guest itself is actually running. Um, so all of the so an administrator enables kubevert for the cluster, or then enable virtualization for the cluster. Um, but then as a user, I'm able to launch VMs in my own namespace. Um, that concludes the demo from my point of view. And I've seen uh, notifications bouncing up and down for chat. So I'm just going to switch back to blue jeans and see uh, what folks want to talk about. So yeah, there's a question in here um, from Aaron um, about struggling with why we would want to run a VM with, within a pod, you know, sort of the opposite direction of where he's been going. So maybe you could add some color to that. Yeah, so what we're seeing is a gradual trend towards starting to get more um, operator inquiries about running OpenShift clusters on bare metal. Um, because for my application containers themselves, uh, so for things that I've already deconstructed or written from scratch in application containers, there's not really any concrete need for the virtualization layer, um, but I still have existing virtualized, virtualized workloads that I want to be able to bring with me as I go through that transition. Uh, and that's what CNV is trying to enable. Um, so yes, I can certainly run Kubernetes and OpenShift clusters on virtual machines today, uh, but where we're seeing a lot of interest, particularly when we think about some of the uh, features we're seeing introduced to Kubernetes around uh, more performance sensitive features like access to GPUs, the virtualization layer is not adding a heap for those use cases. In fact, it's adding uh, complexity, if anything. Um, so CNV is aimed at assisting the people who want to run clusters on bare metal, but bring some of their existing virtual machines with them as part of a complex application. Aaron, did, did that answer your question? Shall I unmute you and let you follow up if you have? Yep, okay, he's, he's settled there. 
So, um, Stephen, do you have a screen um, that you can go back to that has the resources um, where people can connect with you and um, find out more information? That is an excellent point. Yes, I did have a couple of other slides. Um, so, first of all, uh, in terms of the demo, you can run. Um, so, if you go to qvet.io on the landing page, you'll get a link to this, but also you can go to the slash uh, get underscore qvet. Um, there are instructions there for showing you how to quickly run this up on uh, Minishift, MiniQ, um, OC cluster up, basically anything you can get your hands on um, fairly easily. Um, in terms of future plans, uh, we do have a lot of stuff um, planned around writing operators for all the Qvert components themselves, um, adding support for additional VM lifecycle options. Um, adding networking options, uh, which will also improve uh, the things that are available for application containers. Uh, so things like writing host device plugins for layer two networking and SROV. Um, adding more flows to the uh, user interface. Um, turnkey storage solution support. So I mentioned uh, the Libsyndo stuff in particular, uh, and also the ability to tie uh, virtual machines into concepts like daemon sets, jobs, uh, Istio meshes, and so on. Um, in terms of collaboration, uh, we are currently seeking design partners and early adopters uh, willing to kick the tires, um, give us feedback. Um, you know, even if you're just trying it out on a cluster of one, uh, we're interested in your thoughts on what the workflow is like, what you liked, what you didn't like. Um, and in terms of communication, we have a GitHub um, uh, organization. We have a Google group uh, called Qvert Dev. Uh, and we also are on IRC uh, in the hash Qvert uh, channel on irc.freenode.net. Um, if you want to reach out to me directly, I'm also available at sgordon at redhat.com uh, or on Twitter as xsgordon. Um, and basically, feel free to contact us. Uh, and I'm also actually happy to take questions in general on the intersection of Kubernetes and virtualization. Uh, so not just specific to Qvert, very interesting in space. So um, in terms of um, Kubernetes work, uh, SIGs and working groups, is, is there one in particular um, that you guys um, partake in? Yes. Uh, so there is a working group. Uh, and the channel on the Kubernetes Slack is hash virtualization, if I recall correctly. Um, and that's a working group across um, a number of the projects I mentioned um, that have interests around the intersection of Kubernetes and virtualization. So even though the use cases are different, uh, that's an area where we're collaborating with the Kata containers and Gvisor folks, for example. Um, and we didn't have a face-to-face -face meeting at the last uh, KubeCon in Europe. Uh, we did have one last year in Austin, and I think we'll probably have one again in Seattle if folks want to come and say hi. So that, that would be great, because I, I know um... KubeCon is coming up in North America and Seattle um, on December 11th through 13th, and we're going to have another Open Commons gathering on December 10th. So we'll definitely have to figure out how to um, get a either a birds of a feather or one of the deep dive sessions um, set up for you guys, um, so you can connect with people at KubeCon North America. That would be great. Yep, for sure. Find some space so everybody can can actually see each other face to face, that would be great. So um, I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat, so I'm going to give you a few seconds to pop in a question or not. Otherwise, reach out to Steve um, and we'll, we'll try and um, get you connected. You can also connect with um, folks on the OpenShift Commons Slack channel. If you haven't joined OpenShift Commons yet, you can do so, so at um, commons.openshift.org and we'll get you in the Slack channel and then you can reach out to people and talk with your peers there on all kinds of different topics. So thanks again, Stephen, for taking the time today, and we really appreciate it, and we're looking forward to you bringing some of your early adopters back to talk about lessons learned and showcase um, um, how you've incorporated their feedback. So thank you. Yep, for sure. Thank you all for your time.